And uh, I, I don't think um, this next speaker needs any introduction from me at all, other than to say, um, please welcome Rob Bennett. Right, thank you uh, very much, Steve. It's good to see you. It's really lovely to be here and not talk about the school experience and talk about something <laughs> completely different. So you are not getting the slide with the blocks on. <laughs> okay, so there's nothing to do with school experience. Those of you um, who I have talked to know a little bit about my background. Um, I did work in Torbay for 10 years in Key Stage 1 and Key Stage 2. And I've worked here at the university in teacher training for over 15 years, actually, and that's, that's really surprised me. It was quite an interesting time when I got to the sort of 10-year point here, where you think, well, actually, I've kind of been doing this longer than working in the classroom. But I think one of the very good things about the job here is that there's lots of opportunities to work in the classroom. I'd like to talk to you this afternoon and talk for about 45 minutes about something which I feel really passionate about, about creativity, about student teachers and all teachers taking risks in the classroom. So this is what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to talk for about 40 minutes. I'm going to talk about working creatively, what does that mean? I'm going to talk about a historical perspective of conformity. Because we all have to conform. We all have to tick the box. We all have to jump through the hoop. We all have to do what we're told. So we're going to look at the sort of historical context of that in school. And we're all going to look at this notion of the historical context in teacher education. I'm going to talk a little bit about this notion of element as well. So I'm going to introduce to you this notion of an element and how you find your element as a teacher and how we work with children to enable them and to find their element. Most importantly, I'm going to talk a lot about the arts and something I feel really passionately about in school and this notion of creating a rich, varied and exciting curriculum. Okay, so that's what I'm going to talk about. What I'd like to leave you with is a presentation which is genuinely useful for your assignment. So what I'm trying to do is to cram in as much stuff as possible which you can then follow up and look at and quote and use in your assignment. So if you're tackling something to do with the curriculum, to do with conformity, the national curriculum, expectations, English, maths and science, the broader curriculum, those things, this should really help you. I'd like to introduce you to another BA student who I'm going to be quoting rather a lot. And I think the guy's a bit of a hero, actually. Some of you may know him, some of you may not know him. I would encourage all of you to use his material as part of your assignment. Now, this BA student is called Sir Ken Robinson. And he's an English BA student originally from Bretton Hall. And he graduated in 1972. He's gone on to be one of the greatest educationists this country has produced. And for me, as somebody working in teacher education, he talks a lot of sense. So I make no apology for quoting him and talking about him throughout most of this presentation. So if you don't know about Ken Robinson, I suggest you look him up. He's a good guy. So what are we going to look at? We're going to look at creativity very briefly. What is creativity? How do you promote it? What are your views on creativity? How does creativity sit or risk taking with your comfort zone? Okay, so you will all have a preconceived idea of what creativity is and how you promote that and how you foster that in the primary classroom. And I'd like you to start thinking about what have you seen in school? so far and how would you work the same as schools are working and how might you work maybe slightly differently here's an interesting quote just have a think about this and ponder over this for a while okay so i'm doing a lot of work at the moment in a nursery you could ask a nursery child to draw anything okay could you draw a car could you draw a house could you draw Lucy? No problem, Bob. I'll do that. I'll get on it straight away. But 
But if I ask you to draw a car or a portrait of somebody, you'd be really anxious about that. And this is really a really interesting quote. So we are all born creative people. We're all born with this capacity. And the challenge is to remain creative and to remain an artist as you grow up and as you go through life. Ken Robinson says that creativity, he defines creativity as an original idea that has value. An original idea that has value. Could you just think to yourself about your school experiences and just consider when you've seen a child in one of your classes having an original idea that has value? Just think about that. Where a child has come up with something, you've set up the opportunity, something's happened, they've had this idea, and you've thought, wow, this is amazing. One thing I have found with teaching is that children will always come up with something you haven't thought of. For my final school experience on my BA, I was in year six. And for my 10 years of teaching, I worked from year one through to year five. And the most amazing year for me was year one. Put your hands up if you worked in year one for final school experience. Okay? Amazing, loads of you. The amazing thing about year one is, apart from it being incredibly hard work, that it's really challenging, I found it really challenging, but actually the children are just amazing and they come up with amazing ideas. They will always come up with something, always come up with something, which you have not thought about because they see things differently. They see things in the here and now. You're thinking about the future, you're worried about the past. We're not always here, but the children are here and now, and they will always come up with something different. Anna Craft is another name you might want to investigate. Sadly, she's passed away now, a fantastic influential lecturer who worked in Exeter. And she talked about big C and little c. The big C creativity is something we are finding out for the first time as adults. Wow, this is amazing. So the Large Hadron Collider in CERN, that's big C. We're finding this out, we're discovering it for the first time. Little C could actually be for a child, I've discovered that this cork floats. I didn't know that. We know the cork is going to float in the water. Okay? So she talks about big C which is a sort of adult discovery, adult creativity, and small c is when children discover things for the first time. So what skills do children need for the 21st century? Just consider, when are the children that you're going to teach now, when are they going to retire? When are they going to get their first job? When are they going to get married? I saw two of my year one students and the other day one of them was working in Poundland as a, as a summer job, it was his whole time job, okay? But he was working in Poundland. I said, and Nathan, what are you up to? He says, I'm working for French Aerospace. I saw somebody else the other day, and he's just finished his training to be a GP. Okay, so just consider where these people are going. Here's a good argument for you. So this notion of creative thinking, if I said to you creative thinking and come back to me, what does creative thinking mean to you? What does that look like? How do you foster that in your classroom? Sparkling imaginations, first time minds, a willingness to take risks. This is really important when it comes to creativity. This willingness to take risks. To take risks. Okay, sometimes things will go wrong. And Ken Robinson argues that we run the whole of our education system on not getting things wrong. We run our companies, we run our societies, and if people make mistakes or things go wrong, it's the worst thing in the world. So it's some interesting things to consider. If you haven't seen the Monterey lecture on TED by uh, Sir Ken Robinson, it's fantastic. It's really funny and it's, I think, profoundly moving in many ways. So if you haven't seen this, I really strongly urge you 
to go away and watch this. And it has had a phenomenal amount of hits from all over the world. It's very powerful. And he asked the question, are schools killing creativity with this narrow curriculum, with government expectations, with testing, with pressure, etc., etc.? So here we are, great teachers. He argues that great teachers are creative. And we're going to explore as we go through what this notion of creativity looks like. We are not just delivery systems. We are not just delivery systems. And you should not see yourself as a, as a delivery system. When you came here, you did a fantastic interview. Your passion and your drive came through and we asked you to come and join the course. And we hope that you still have that passion and that drive now. Yes, to deliver the curriculum. Yes, to do the statutory things, which we have to do by law, but actually to do that extra bit. To have that sparkle, to have that imagination, to go one step further. Okay, so here is a historical perspective. So through the 200s, Working in school, and I'd like you to compare this to where we are now. You have the literacy and the numeracy <coughs> concerns. So there's a literacy hour introduced, and there is a numeracy time, which was very prescribed, very, very prescribed. There were rigid standards for teachers. You had to reach this standard. They were inspected by Austin. Teachers were a product of the system. So the teachers who came into teaching had gone up through this system as well. And we had all of the national curriculum focus. I tried to find it, but I couldn't find it. There's a very good picture of a, of a teacher in the late 90s sort of carrying all the national curriculum focus like this, all of them, all this prescribed work which they had to teach like this. So the main driver in the early 200s, late 1990s, early 2000s really, not 200s, that would be something different, is English, maths, and science, this English, maths, and science. And they're really important. Of course they're really important. But there are other subjects as well. So in 2003, this document was produced. It is archived, it is still available. I think even now, 13 years later, it is still relevant. Because it argues for an excellent and, and uh, uh, Curriculum which is excellent and enjoyable, and a, a curriculum which is varied and very, very rich. So again, come look at this document. A rich, varied, and exciting curriculum. So yes, English, maths, and science are core, they're really important, but there are other subjects as well. So what did initial teacher training look like in the 2000s? Incidentally, I had a discussion with Henrietta later, uh, earlier on today, and she was talking about ITT and ITE. ITT is Initial Teacher Training. ITE is Initial Teacher Education. This term, training, tends to be used by the government, along with the term trainee, and this term tends to be used with teacher educators or universities that train teachers, along with students. So sometimes we, we refer to you as students, sometimes we refer to you as trainees. And you can see that there's a kind of a tension there as well. Because yes, we are training you, but we would like to see that we are educating you as well as training you as well. And you are students, not just trainees. So, in, edu in uh, teacher education, these things were happening in the 2000s. Lots of government legislation, the importance of delivering the national curriculum. There was a, a training and development agency which oversaw teacher training and there were standards for teachers. Everything was very regimented, everything was very tight, everything was very conformist. Okay, and there was, a, there was a real concern about this. So what about creativity, risk taking? Your personal vision, your passion, where is your passion in this as a beginning teacher? And there is a real concern about achieving the old standards, which were defunct in 2012, and actually going beyond just jumping through the hoop and ticking the boxes. Okay? Actually going for that wow factor. We're going to look and see what that wow factor looks like as we go through. So there is a real concern. So there is a project 
which ran here at, the, at Plymouth University, and it was called the Hearts Project. And it was looking at the arts in primary education and in schools, the Hearts Project. So higher education and the arts in schools. And it was a project looking at promoting the arts. Yes, doing English, math, and science, but looking at the arts. And here's a, an interesting statement. So if you think of a concert, if you think of a book, you think of that feeling you get when you come out of a film, like you've actually been on a journey or you've been somewhere. You know, very often we feel totally differently when we engage in the arts. And if we have a very narrow and very conformist curriculum, many children are going to miss out, potentially, on those opportunities. So let me tell you a little bit about this project. This project was set up, it was looking at not conforming, it was looking at revitalizing teacher training, it was looking at saying to university uh, trainees and students, it's okay to do this, it's okay to take a risk. Try this, think out of the box. Yes, achieve that standard, but do things slightly differently. Take a risk, make a mistake, try something new. So people felt in the sector that things were being, it was very drab, things were being drawn down, it was having to teach these things, deliver these things, and there was a real danger of teachers being just delivery systems. So what did it look like at Plymouth? It was set up for final year B.A. students, it was linked to final placements, the university and the partnership uh, teachers in school worked with it. We did lots of projects. We worked with the National Portrait Gallery, we did a music project where we gave every student a show to take into, take into school. So every student had a show. We worked with the BBC, and the BBC said, yes, you can have a copyright to this show. So we gave you the songs, the music, and we gave you that to take into school. We did some work with drama, looking at drama techniques, and we did some work with storytelling, and we also did some work with art. We made clay animals, fictitious clay animals. And we did storytelling based on those animals. Where did they come from? Where are they going to? How they created? What's their story? And we got aspects of the curriculum from this work. Students were encouraged to take risks, work collaboratively, and work creatively throughout. One of the projects is that we took this picture here. Does anyone know what this picture is? Who is it? Artists? Art people? No? Back here? On Rene Rousseau, Tropical Tiger in the Jungle, and we gave this to a, a final B.Ed. student and said, could you get all aspects of the curriculum from this one picture? This is a project with the National Portrait Gallery called Take One Picture, where schools, a, a class in school took a picture and they got all aspects of the curriculum from this one picture. But we can't do that because we've got to do this, we've got to do this, we have to do this national curriculum, we need to take this box. If you think about it, you could get lots of richness and lots of ideas from this. You could get science, really good science ideas, really good music ideas, all just from one picture. So it's Omre, Russo, Tropical Tiger in the Jungle. This is just one of the projects we did. So how do the students feel about this? You know, you're here, you need to tick these boxes, you need to achieve the standards, you need to do these things. This is how they felt. When they knew they were doing music, uh, and they were going to be doing singing, and they were going to be doing these sort of things. There was a real, there was quite a lot of hostility. It was met with quite, quite a lot of hostility and quite a lot of uncertainty. They felt that there was a loss of control. People thought, hey, you know, we're going to play at this. And it's, it's having that gut to actually have a go, and dare to do that, dare to play, dare to explore, dare to be different. It's okay to do this. Okay? People went sometimes, often, out of their comfort zone. People were worried about, can I get this right? Is it going to be okay? And many students felt that they were breaking new ground and doing new things which they hadn't necessarily done before. It was really quite revolutionary. A lot of people felt iffy about letting go. If I said to you, you're going to get all aspects of the curriculum from this one picture, and I gave you a picture when you start your first job, how do you feel about that? 
What do I need my planning? I need this, I need to do this, I need to do that. Okay? So people felt really very sort of um, self-conscious about it. They were worried about their hearts. Their hearts said, actually, I want to do this. But their minds were saying, no, I'm going to do the national curriculum stuff. Okay? And many people felt that this letting go was a personal development of themselves. There's more information here you can look up later. So where are we today? So that was in the early 2000s. Now we're up to 2016. We still have this conformity. You still have to jump through the hoop. You still have to achieve the standards. But the message I would like to give you this afternoon is to really go beyond the standards and be the best possible teacher you can by believing and following your passion and your vision. And I think one of the strong things about this aspect, and I know it's hard, the assignment's really hard, is it will really make you examine where you are with this and where you want to be going. It's really has been a review of teacher training. You may want to quote this in your assignment. There has also, in the last few weeks, been a white paper looking at teacher training and education generally. Again, you might want to quote this in your assignment. We still want you to achieve the standards. I've gone over the line, Benji. Am I still in view? Okay. There are still the standards, which you've done brilliantly. Congratulations for working so hard with your assignments and so hard during school experience. Some of you had very great times, some of you had terrible times, and it was hard work. Really hard work, but you pushed through and you were resilient. Now is the time to reflect on your degree. I've been here for three years. This is the end. This is the sort of twilight. Where am I up to? Where's my passion? Where's my vision? Where am I going next with this? Where are the fireworks? How am I going to get into school and really produce the business? Here's that quote again. So what I'm asking you to do this afternoon with your assignment and as you go into your first jobs is go beyond those narrow expectations. And I'm going to talk about what that looks like. And creativity is risk-taking and risk-taking is one of those things you can do to go beyond those narrow expectations. Do watch this video if you haven't seen it. Just to finish off, finding the elements. Ken Robinson once again talks about this. It's the thing which you love to do and the thing which you're good at. So could you talk to the person next to you about the one thing which you really love to do and the thing which you're really good at? <laughs> I'm pretty good at that. I'm okay at that. I'm all right. I'm okay. And when those things come together, 
when those things when when those things come together, you are in your element. That's when you're in your element. So this is another thing which Sir Ken Robinson argues. Any any ideas? Anyone want to be really brave? Perhaps, perhaps you're really good with really young children, and actually when you're teaching your subject, it really comes together and it's you, you really enjoy it. Does anyone want to be really brave? Steve's got the microphone. Benji's got the video camera. No brush out. Yeah. Any ideas? It doesn't matter if not. The thing you really love and the thing you're really good at. I think people aren't volunteering because teachers are really good at saying the things you're not good at. <laughs> if I said, could you tell me all the things you're not good at? I'd say, oh, I need to improve this. I'm reflecting on practice. <laughs> I'm not good at this. Okay? So just in your mind, just consider this notion of the thing you love doing and the things you're good at. My argument is, actually, you're doing English, maths, and science, but there is geography, history, music, PE, and all of the other subjects. And children in school, some children will be amazing at those subjects. And if we haven't got a rich and varied curriculum, and if we don't work creatively, those children will not achieve their elements. Just think about this. Don't do music because you won't get a job in music. That is not true. Are you okay? I was like, what? What? It's okay. Okay, you sure? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, yes. You might not know the X Factor, you might not play the London Symphony Orchestra, but actually those transferable skills can be used for a number of other things. And there are lots of opportunities. I know people who are professional musicians, we have friends who are professional actors, we have friends who work in geography, we have people who work professionally in physical education who are not teachers, personal trainers, they work in other areas. So a rich, broad, and varied curriculum. The element is the point at which the natural talent meets the personal passion. And if you are teaching a narrow, restricted, conformist curriculum, the children in your class are never going to reach their full potential. Are never going to reach their full potential. Because you have to work in that way and give them that rich and varied curriculum, that rich and varied opportunity. It's really important. So my top tip for all of you is to find that element in every child. Find that element in every child. Something else Ken Robinson says, he talks a lot about, the children you're working with will go into jobs which at this point in time do not exist. Okay? When you got to 16, when you got to 18, there were a whole load of jobs there which were not available when you were five. Okay? Because of technology, because of um, other demographics and other things as well. So it's really interesting. So again, this notion of a rich, varied, and exciting curriculum. I'll let you have a read of that in your own time. Something which you might find useful if you haven't already seen this, and this should really help your assignment. And um, I'm just talking about Ken Robinson's view of education, which I tend to sort of uh, concur with and agree with. And I think he's a, he's a really good um, sort of thinker on the arts and creativity. If you go to this website, which is linked down here, there is a Radio 4 series called The Educators. And Sarah Montague from the um, Today programme interviews lots of key thinkers on education areas and topics. So if you're an, uh, an auditory learner, like I am, and you need to watch and particularly listen to things rather than read them, you could call up these podcasts and you could hear key people talking about aspects of education. 
which could be quite revolutionary. And this will enable you to really think and consider who decides the curriculum. This person, who's one of Steve's personal friends, isn't it, Steve? This guy here, he's in Newcastle. So he's in the He talks about actually giving the children a problem, giving them a series of iPads, and allowing them to solve that problem as a group, collaboratively, in a room. Am I wrong, Steve? It's that type of thing, isn't it? Okay? So actually, the children are problem solving. The children are creating their own curriculum. They're working collaboratively. They're working creatively. Okay? So if you, there's some really interesting stuff here. Check, cite them right with regards to how to correctly reference a podcast. But there's a magic amount of stuff here for you to download and keep. It's really good, really interesting. So to conclude, here are some points in terms of creativity, a rich and varied curriculum, and each child finding their element. The first one is find your teaching vision and passion. You've achieved the standards. In fact, every single person in this room has achieved the standards as a student teacher beyond satisfactory, beyond a three. You've all got a handful of twos. Some of you have got twos across the board. Some of you have got ones across the board. So you've done that. You've ticked the box. What I'm arguing for this afternoon is for you now to go further, to work creatively, and to show your passion. Support every child in finding their element. This child's really good at map reading. Just like amazing at map reading. They are just incredible. Let them do map reading. Develop it. Okay? Yes, do the English, Maths, and Science, but actually foster that. What about the child in your class who is an amazing piano player, who speaks French fluently? How are you going to promote that passion? How are you going to help every child find their element and succeed and live a fruitful, exciting, and a very enjoyable life? Foster collaboration at every point in your classroom. Children working together. Children problem solving, children helping, working, teamwork all the time. Go for the wow factor. Make a giant the height of this room. Start an orchestra. Invite Michael Morpurgo into your classroom. Go for the wow factor. Be all singing and dancing. Cartwheel as a teacher. Cartwheel as a teacher. But not all the time. You can do all the time. You're going to burn out. But really go for those set pieces where you really wow the children, the parents, and the rest of the school. This is amazing. I can't believe this person is in their first year of teaching. This person is in their second year of teaching. It's incredible. Foster risk-taking. How many times during your school experience did the children just have a go at something? How many times did they use trial and error? How many times, most importantly, did you do problem solving, which is open-ended? That child who's amazing with mathematics, okay? Lucy, I found nine ways of doing this. How many ways can you find? Mr. Bennett, I found 37. Open-ended problem solving. As teachers, we've got the answer. The children's got the answer, that's fine, let's move on. The problem solving should be open-ended. How many of your children have got things wrong? It's okay to get things wrong. Children don't put their hands up because they're going to be wrong. You didn't want to answer about the um, element because you were slightly embarrassed about saying what well, you were good at. But you're also slightly embarrassed about maybe getting it wrong or saying the wrong thing or people laughing at you. Okay? It's okay to get things wrong. Let's make mistakes. Have a classroom where mistakes are fine. Um, this is a safe environment to make a mistake. Imagine how you feel about assessment and you being assessed. Assessment is an emotional thing. If I said to you, this is really poor, this is a really poor piece of work, you feel terrible. Okay? So foster a classroom where it's okay to get things wrong. A rich and varied, exciting curriculum. Yes, toe the line. Yes, tick the box. But really go for looking at all curriculum subjects and be an arts champion. Even the ones you can't do, like art, 
and music, mark my words, at least one person in this room who is not an art person will come to me in the next five years, if I'm still working here, and say, Rob, you will never believe it, I'm the art coordinator. <laughs> So make sure you give it a go. Learn with the children. When all the children play ukuleles in year three with the expert ukulele person, you learn the ukulele as well. Give it a go. Respond to the needs of individual children. As a beginning teacher, I have my plan. I'm going to teach this lesson. This lesson is going to be all fine, absolutely fine. But actually what you should be doing is changing and adapting and varying and continuously assessing where children are up to and changing and adapting. Everybody write this down. Stage a show. Every year. My school don't do a show. What I should do is everyone put their hand on their heart like this. No, no we won't. But we, but, but, but we could do this. Well, you all do this. And I say, Rob, I promise in the first two years, because it might be tricky in the first year, but in the second year you could do it, I promise to put on the show. My, my school don't do a show. Okay, I'm, I'm in the school where they don't do a show. We'll put it on. Put on a show. You will see children in a completely different light when they're working towards something. When they're working towards a newspaper article. When they're working towards a blog. Getting a website finished. All of these things. When they're working up to something, and they're working creatively, and it's open-ended, and it's exciting, and there's a product at the end, it will be really exciting. Go on residential. How many of you have gone on residential with children and actually seen, when you go on residential, like Ben's different, Ben's really different, he's like a leader, and in classroom, he doesn't behave like this. But on residential, Ben steps up, and he's this amazing leader of children. How many of you have been on residential? Okay? If you get into a school which don't do a residential, get them doing a residential. Well, I promise. <laughs> Last few things. Sustain and continue your practice. You've worked for three years, but you are not the finished article. Okay? At the end of the course, you'll still be training, there'll still be training opportunities, there'll still be things to do. So sort out what your priorities are and consider open-ended, working, lots of problem solving, lots of collaboration. It's the second time I've put that down. I've put it before, so it must be important. Okay, so make sure you do that in terms of collaboration. So just to finish off, really believe in and sustain your own vision and values to teaching. Your own vision and values to teaching. Consider what I've said about creativity, about risk taking, and when I mean risk taking, I'm not talking about the child absolutely. I am talking about building a life size giant in the canteen. I am talking about going on residential, putting on a show, class newspaper, fashion show for parents, all of those things, taking risks. This has never happened before. Take a risk. It might not work. It doesn't matter. Take a risk. Okay? But really believe in and sustain your own vision and values for teaching. And most importantly, when you do leave here, keep in contact with Keith and Steve and the rest of the team through your first year and beyond. Even if you're working in Watford, <laughs> who's working in Watford? <coughs> Watford? Or even if you're working in other places, keep in touch with the team as you go. And thank you very much for listening. That's it. Thank you very much, Rob. That was a fabulous song, Prince, which is that. Um, while you're getting your heads around questions, and uh, put your hands up when you want to ask a question, let me, let me feel the first question here for you. Um, I had the distinct honour, two years ago in Oslo, to chair a discussion between two keynote speakers, Sir Ken Robinson and Sir Arthur Mitra. And it was on the side in the middle of them, trying to get them to argue. I couldn't do it. I, I, it was very difficult. I did get them to argue in the end. 
But the point is, there are people that argue against what I'm saying. Yeah. What would you say to people who suggest that instead of giving children creative space, what we should be doing is making sure they get as much knowledge into their heads to cope with society as possible? Yeah. I think what we've got to do is consider what skills we want children to have. What skill set do we want children to have for this century? You know, many of these skill sets are things like collaboration, cooperation, massive ICT skills, huge ICT skills, this notion of creativity, being able to discuss things, problem solving, all of these things. So these are not things you can do on a SAT or on a multiple, on a multiple choice test or any of those things. These are skills. Many people would say that these skills are the hidden curriculum. So I think as teachers, you need to think to yourself, where are these children going and what skills do they need? And there are many people, as well as Ken Robinson, who are, who are arguing for this notion of fostering this type of working. Yes, the knowledge is important. Yes, the content is important. But why do year four children need to know all of their Roman numerals? Apart from finding out when a Doctor Who episode was made. <laughs> so I think it's, it's, it's exploring the subtlety, Steve, of the hidden <coughs> curriculum and looking at all of those skills which are going to prepare people for the workplace. And I think Nick Gibbs absolutely right that school's purpose is actually to prepare children for that workplace and actually moving forward and making sure they're really prepared for that. But I, I'm, I'm not sure that just this massive amount of knowledge, it, it, and that's really important, but it, there are other things as well. Okay, so maybe knowledge isn't enough, we need other things in the curriculum as well, which are there. Um, we just come from a seminar and we talked about in space about between knowledge and skills and a lot of us talked about it's important to have a creative curriculum and that's the whole reason why they revamped the curriculum to give us more freedom but we're still teaching to the test the staff in year two and year six so how would you suggest for those learners especially at six and seven years old to be motivated to learn and all we're doing is that rote learning you need to learn this you need to do that and you lose that It's, it's a really good question and it's a real tension and I don't have a magic answer. You have to do what is statutorily required. You have to deliver that. You have to make sure you work closely with your head teacher and senior management team. And you have to comply. You have to do that. But there are pockets through the week. There are pockets through the term where you can do other things. For example, with year six children, once year six have done their SATs, you've got a really big window of opportunity to do, you know, other things. So it's remembering and believing in what you believe in, and at certain points in time, finding when those points are, but you're absolutely right, you are going to need to work within that framework and tick that box and jump through that hoop, I'm afraid. I haven't got a magic wand. You were okay. talking about teaching the children the skills they need for this coming future. Century. <laughs> uh, century. And um, what about all the handwriting and the uplifts in there? You must be able to perform each letter perfectly by the, the end of year two. Whereas now, if you look around the lecture room, there's quite a few people on laptops. And I'm only writing because I'm used to it. That's what I've always done. But I mean, it's, a, it's, it's the same question as a, as a conformity. Yeah. We are going to need to conform, but what I'm saying is we need to pack you up with a vision and a value and a passion, a real passion. So yes, you do tick the box, you do work and support towards the test and everything else, but actually there is that extra firework and that extra fire which will fire you to actually go that little bit further. And yes, you will need to teach the handwriting and to actually get that right and the Roman numerals and everything else. But I think you need to have that sort of that, that, that passion and that desire to go that little bit further as well. And it's really hard to do that to, and to sustain it. So are you time. saying that it's those who set the assessments who define the curriculum? Ooh, that sounds like an assignment. <laughs> Say that again. Are you saying that it's those who define the assessments who define the curriculum? 
Well, you could argue um, that it is the government that set the curriculum, but if you look at the government's agenda with three schools and academies and outstanding schools, they can set their own curriculum. But not their own assessment. Different schools are working in assessment in different ways. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Who else has a question? Um, yeah, okay. Coming down to you. As far as my legs are getting. This is a bit of an assignment question, so it might be more Steve. Yes, um, it is. Sorry. <laughs> um, with this assignment, are we encouraged to use our creativity and doing things differently, or is the assessment of the university going to kind of limit what we can do? All right, that's, that, is, that is a great question. There, there is no limit to what you can do in the summer. Um, apart from the 5,000 words, of course, uh, plus or minus 10 percent. But the point is that when you talk about creative um, kind of interpretation of the assignment question, I gave you an example earlier on, didn't I, about how you can bend the question to suit your needs. So it depends on how you define the curriculum. What, how are you going to define the curriculum yourself before you start to talk about how you should define it? So what do you mean by the curriculum? There's a creative possibility there for you. The curriculum for you could be the homeschooling curriculum that we talked about a few days ago, couldn't it? Which, after all, is, is a different type of curriculum to anything we teach in, in, in state-funded or, or, or um, grant-maintained schools. Um, Rob's just said, and he's alluded to the fact that by 2022, all schools in this country must be a part of an academy. That's the white paper that's just come out in, in recent weeks. Now, if that's going to be the case, then all schools will have a chance to define their own curriculum. I think there's a question over the assessment. Um, I think that's still going to be very much controlled by the government. I, I think you heard Nick um, three, two days ago saying that actually the government's still going to have a, a hand on the curriculum because they will be defining the assessments and setting the levels which children have to achieve. But the way you interpret that, going back to your question, is, is again, it can be very creative, couldn't it? Think about ways that you can take that question and, and um, kind of focus on your way of answering it. Does that help you? Yeah. I hope so. Any other questions? Do you want to add to that, Rob, at all? Yeah. Because you've seen this assignment before. Yeah. I think if you can, if you could go a little bit off on a tangent long as you can justify that and make an argument, actually so-and-so says this, this is supported by so-and-so as well. My experiences are here and the government says this. I've done a lot of work recently with the PTCEs and what we've recommended with them, and I think it will be useful for you, is see what the government says. Steve, tell me if this is wrong. See what academic texts say yeah. and reflect on your experience. And with those three elements, You've got the nice basis for a critical argument. So actually, the government says this. This is happening in school because I've seen it and I've done it. But actually, if you look at all the all the academic texts, they said we should be doing something else. And then you've got a nice basis for an argument there. Or you've got this 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 sort of three bits of information. Is, is that classic example there might be that the government says that we should uh, run assessments in this particular way. Um, then you've got um, your own experience in schools, which says actually that's a waste of time for some students because it's beyond their own scope. Or it doesn't measure what we think it should be measuring. And then you talk about some evidence from maybe Dylan William, exactly. the assessment for learning rather than assessment of learning, exactly. which is turning the whole thing on its head and saying, look, feedback's much more important than giving a grade because it's much more motivating and it helps also for students to improve their performance next time. So there is an argument just on the basis of. of uh, Rob's three points. Yes. So having, having those three points can be, can be really useful because often you get attention from those three points because actually they very rarely all agree and concur and it's, and it's quite useful to have that. Any other questions? Put your hand up before there's two, right? You first. Um, you spoke about uh, creating an environment where it's okay to make mistakes, but with the high expectations on teachers for your children to perform and for your performance. And um, how do you balance that test culture and creating that environment? Yeah. Right, don't it's the kind of same question three times, isn't it? It's the it's the, still the, want the answer. Yeah, it's the yeah, you still want the answer. Um, 
there's, there, are, there is no magic answer. You need to talk to, um, you know, people who are working in schools at the moment, um, and they are still there because they have the passion. They are ticking the box and everything else. Um, and I think you've just got to go out. We've got to pack you off with, you know, something you really believe in. So as you're not just delivery systems, you have a vision and a passion for teaching. And I think one of the worrying things at the moment, just to go slightly off the point, is actually how do you sustain that? How many of you are going to be working in two years, in five years, in seven years, in 12 years' time and beyond? Because we want you to sustain and stay in the job. And when you've got this tension of actually, I really want to do this, and I really want to allow the children to do that, but however, in six weeks' time, you've got to do this test, and you've got to keep all those plates going and everything else, you know, it's really hard. But I think if you've got a really steely core, you can tick the boxes, and you have all demonstrated that you can tick the box, because you've achieved the standards as student teachers really well. And that's, that's in the bag. That's done. Okay? So, yes, tick the box, but really fight for what you believe in. Find pockets of time where you can work creatively and take risks. I don't know. Um, I don't wish to speak out of line, but um, <laughs> however, can I defend the Roman numerals? Would that be okay? And then ask a question of Michelle. Um, I think the Roman numerals provides a great basis and uh, knowledge of history to appreciate our decimal system and the big C discoveries from the decimal system compared to our Roman numeral system. Sorry. Um, <laughs> and my question was that uh, your presentation kind of put across this really nice point about um, the core is really, really important and definitely that's important. Um, but you then almost juxtaposed it with creativity and made that seem sort of separate. Um, but then with lines such as like poetry in English, and, oh, and yeah. I'm just wondering what your thoughts right. are. Is that is that okay? No, no cre creativity is everywhere. You know, it's not just the arts. I, I tend to push the arts because that's my thing. You know, just <coughs> anything else, but creativity in science, obviously in English, and uh, in mathematics, creativity in mathematics. Yeah, that, and, and creative discovery. Absolutely, absolutely. That yeah. leads to my question: yeah. Is um, can creativity be logical, or logic be creativity? Being creative, either vice versa. Can creativity be logical? And can logic be creative? I don't know, discuss. Steve, I <laughs> Steve, I'll take the mic off. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know, Adam. Um, no. I think it's got to be spontaneous. I think if you're creative, if you want to work creatively, there has to be an element of skill. So, for example, you just cannot put a group of children into the classroom with some instruments and say, Compose over to you. But, you know, there, there, there has to be, they have to know how to play the instrument, they have to know a structure, a framework, it needs to be framed, it needs to be set up. Yeah, it's like yeah. the Higgs boson, that's big C creativity that's followed logic, isn't it? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. That's why yeah. I was trying to have that conflict in my head of yeah. creativity and logic, are they separate or are they the same? Are they... I, think, I think creativity probably isn't logical, but it is spontaneous. <laughs> one, one final question for you, Ron. Uh, I think you've enjoyed this, and you're all certainly thinking and, and, and talking about yourselves now, but one final question before we even close with Rob. Um, you mentioned learning and failure, um, that, that we often kind of militate against learning that way because we, we're meant to succeed, we're meant to get grades and, and always uh, pass the test. Um, what, what is it about learning with failure that, that, that we should be looking at? It's, I think it's to, to create a culture in your classroom where children are prepared to have a go. And I think if, if children have a fear or concern about getting things wrong or failing, they're not actually going to put themselves up for something or put themselves forward in terms of developing their learning. So I think it's creating classrooms, not creating people classrooms to fail and to make errors and to get things wrong. Of course, that's not, a, not the right thing to do. But classrooms where children feel comfortable to have a go and to take a risk. It was wonderful. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you. Robert.